This podcast is brought to you by Craft Beer and Brewing Magazine for those that love to make and drink great beer. Learn more online or subscribe at beerandbrewing.com or find us on social media at Craft Beer Brew. Welcome to the Craft Beer and Brewing Podcast. I'm your host, co-founder and editorial director of Craft Beer and Brewing Magazine, Jamie Bogner. My guest on the podcast today is someone that I've wanted to talk to since we started this podcast, uh, Vinny Chalurzo from Russian River Brewing. Welcome to the podcast, Vinny. Oh, thanks. Thanks for uh, coming to Windsor. Coming all the way out here to Windsor, California yeah. uh, to make a special trip to, to record some podcasts on, here. On that direct flight into STS. You know, see, I was convinced that you wanted me to come out here just so you had extra traffic on that flight uh, <laughs> so that United uh, doesn't have second thoughts about that. <laughs> but uh, but now that I'm here, I think there might be some other reasons, right. too. Good. Uh, this is part one of, uh, of two parts of the podcast. We're going to talk in uh, part one this week about uh, clean beers and hoppy beers. And uh, part two next week, we're going to talk about some sour beers. And so we're going to record them back to back and use the mystery and magic of editing to make them appear in separate weeks because that's just, you know, how we roll. Uh, before we get started, uh, as the brewing industry's premier choice for glycol chilling, GND Chillers has set the standard on quality, service, and dedication to their customers' craft. For 25 years, GND has led the way on innovative solutions that match their brewing customers' immediate and future needs. With a wide selection of custom built chillers, GND offers the Nano Chiller, the perfect solution for nano breweries, all the way up to their larger capacity units like the Vertical Air Chiller built for higher volume operations. Contact GND Chillers today for your chiller sizing needs at 1-800-555-0973 or reach out online at gdchillers.com. Also, the founders launched SS Brewtech with a very clear goal to advance brewing equipment design, performance, and quality to the very highest standards in the industry. With a team that draws upon strong functional backgrounds in brewing science, mechanical engineering, industrial design, supply chain, and manufacturing, SS Brewtech has the people and skill sets you'd want and expect from your supplier of pro brewing equipment. Head over to ssbrewtech.com for more information on their brew houses and brewing gear. Uh, it's actually convenient because you use all of the sponsors for our podcast. I, I do. I showed you our G and D chiller yeah, you coming did. in. They're they're awesome. We had such a good experience with them. They're amazing. A little shout out to Paul for all his amazing customer service. Well, yeah. it's a cool thing when uh, you know sponsors of our podcast are also so highly regarded by yeah. uh, by folks yeah. in the industry. And so. We've got a SS Brewtech Five Barrel Pilot Brewery. Hopefully on the water, yeah, coming this way soon. Oh, very cool, yeah. very cool. And uh, yeah, you use BSG and, and uh, BSG remember the BA and is our, <laughs> they're our base malt or malt supplier mostly. Raw, right. yep. yeah, yeah. No, that's that's fantastic. <laughs> well, um, you know, since I've, I'm out here in uh, Union Brewery in Windsor, uh, I don't know that people listening to this podcast really need the standard, uh, you know, small arc of uh, history. Because if there's any brewery uh, and craft brewery in North America right now that people know the story of, you know, it's probably Russian River Brewing. Uh, you know, you all possess, uh, you know, this kind of, uh, you know, uh, influential you know space to where uh many 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 craft brewers that i've talked to uh you know mention you as an influence for what they do you know as far as hoppy beers and i don't mean to like you know f uh, blow a uh, smoke up your ass before we, <laughs> we start this off but uh, uh, <laughs> uh you know so anyway that that history i don't think we need to, to yeah. really talk about it. you know it's all out there people yeah. know um you know but you have just embarked on this new chapter for russian river brewing which is this huge Basically, what open for about six months now? Yep. Uh, production? Well, I shouldn't say huge. It's an eighty-five thousand square feet production brewery. <laughs> Call um, a spade a spade. It's you know, you know, it's two acres of building alone. It is, and in the last six months, you've uh, you know doubled, more than doubled yeah. the output, a uh, yearly output of Russian River, and are embarking in a whole new chapter for Russian River. Um, tell me a little bit about uh, what spurred on this latest chapter of uh, of the brewery, because you know, before you jumped into this kind of thing. You're making plenty of beer, making a good living, enjoying a you know a, a nice lifestyle yeah. off of what you're making. There wasn't necessarily a need to jump into this kind of scale of production and this kind of, of yeah. way of operating a brewery, and it created a whole, you know years and years of stress of construction of hey Vinny can you do this and hey I can't yeah. do this because we're still under construction yeah. and I you know we asked you for a couple years yeah. you know to, to yeah. come do things like uh, the brewers retreat and others uh, which is next week in yeah. Maine but I can't uh, wait. <laughs> 
uh, you know, but but this project just you know took so much of your time, so much of your energy. Um, why go do this at this this phase in your brewing career? Yeah, you know, Natalie and I have always dreamt of building our dream brewery, and you know, this this is it. And it really started with uh, buying out all of our investors, and that that happened several years ago. Yeah. And from that point, we were happy with the organic growth. And, you know, I'm really flattered that there's a lot of breweries out there that have followed our model. And I I hear it all the time from young brewers. And it's very humbling to hear when someone comes up to Natalie and I separate together, whatever, and just, you know, we followed your slow growth model. And and then they come and see this and you're like, "Uh, what happened to the slow growth model? Well, what it was was that slow growth model paying cash for almost everything and very little borrowed money um, allowed us to squirrel enough money away to build, you know, um, really good credit with, with a bank and, and also a bit of a war chest to, to be able to build our dream brewery right. with everything with, you know, an automated German brew house and open top fermenters and, you know, the Zeman fermenters with the amazing the cones of their tanks, the way that the yeast just slides out because they're polished so nicely. And um, But it was something that Natalie and I always wanted to do. Um, and when it when the opportunity popped up, we said, wow, you know, we can actually do this. We can afford it. And I think it's one of the things Natalie and I are most proud of is that we yeah. did it independently. And, you know, I don't, Natalie and I do not begrudge anyone for sure, sure. selling, taking on private equity. Everyone needs an exit strategy. And, but we are fiercely independent and we're not ready to retire. And so, yeah, we did this all on our own. You know, wow. So no good, equity partners, you mm-mm. know, just. It's just a little us. bit of bank debt and your, your cash. As Natalie says, good old fashioned bank debt and, and cash flow. And, and huh. we did it. And, um, you know, we wanted to give our employees a, a nicer facility to work out of. And we still have our brew pub downtown, which is, right. you know, it's, right. it's like it's an old, you know, pair of jeans or old rock concert T-shirt that you won't throw out. That's really comfortable. Yeah, yeah. And then this is something totally different. It's a different experience. The restaurant's right. different, but we wanted that. You know, one of the biggest requests we would get though was uh, a tours. And so we're set up with self-guided tours and guided tours. Um, another thing was wanting to separate out the funky brewery. Right, right. We've always had uh, separate equipment, but we always did it under one roof at the old production brewery. Well, you're here in Santa Rosa, you know, the kind of Sonoma Valley, um, you know, tourism and seeing the places where the things are made is, you know, it's kind of part of the culture in this area. And, you know, and I can see why I have building a destination brewery for people that are coming to destination wineries and having that kind of experience, you know, kind of provide some richness and some depth for people that are already making that kind of trip. It it seems sensible from that perspective to to you know, build this kind of thing. And what's amazing is, I mean, everything you said is just spot on. And what's amazing is still, even though we're very well known, most of the tourists are still going to the old brewery, which mm. is fine because yeah. it's given yeah. us a chance to to get settled in here. Um, but, you know, the being able to build a brewery greenfield from the ground up and do it the way we want and in the design we want and the layout we want to be able to tie in hospitality guided to or self-guided to or in such a way that you can't or be near impossible to do into in an existing building sure, whether you were sure. going in into a building that already existed and you were going to do tenant improvements or you know go or have a brewery and add it in then it, then it probably is impossible so that that opportunity was too rich to pass up and we're thrilled the way it, it turned out. And, well, you have uh, a reputation for perfectionism. Yeah. And, uh, you know, as we toured the building before we started the podcast, uh, you know, you can see that in all the details. This is not a facility that somebody built just to make a whole bunch of money off of. Uh, it's one that you, like like uh, you know Ken Grossman in Sierra Nevada, that they spent an en- enormous amount of money yeah. on. Um, one that it would be hard to calculate a return on investment for in purely financial terms. It yeah. has to be driven by a love for what you're doing and also the you know a desire to to make the highest quality possible thing you know that you want to make because you have a passion for doing that and so you can see that in the facility here and it's uh, it's pretty awesome there's a lot there's a lot of mills river in this brewery and yeah, the yeah. design and ken ken was a invaluable mentor for for us and yeah. uh, i i owe him a lot for 
just being available to me. And, and also in the most uncanny times, he would call just randomly in the middle of the project, you know, how's it going? And inevitably it was like, I was having a horrible day. Something went wrong. And someone like Ken has been through it so much over the decades he's been in the industry. And he talked me off the ledge a few times. So, <laughs> um, but, uh, but yeah, you know, we, we toured breweries all over the country for years yeah. um, and took notes, good and bad. And, you know, the, the craft beer industry is this very collegial industry and it, you know, wow, was that was so apparent when we really dug into breweries looking at specifics of building a brewery like this from right. scratch and trying to do it perfect, yet knowing you'll never get it perfect. There's always going to be something. I, I didn't show you when we were touring around, but there's this post right outside of the in the between the packaging and the warehouse. And it's like, why didn't I just move that over five feet? <laughs> it's a damn post, but it's right yeah, in the yeah. way. It's like, <laughs> oh, well, like I like I said, uh, you know, you're always going to regret something, you know. And hindsight's <laughs> always going to be twenty twenty. And if it's uh, if it's something like that, then uh, you know you you're doing pretty well yeah, for yourself. Yeah. So let's uh, let's talk about making beer. You know, I mean, that's what our audience loves to to talk about. And uh, you know, I, I was struck that for someone operating a brewery of this size. Uh, you're really hands on with uh, you know the product and the process around making the beer. You've really put a thought, a lot of thought into you know uh, simply the way that the beers are designed. Um, and so you know, I'd love to to, to get into that uh, you know that level of conversation. Yeah. Um, but first, let's talk about hops. You know, I think uh, you know of all the beers and the styles that you're you're most known for, uh, pushing IPAs from the early days. Uh, 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 in the 1990s up to today and kind of you know being one of those leaders on the forefront of the IPA uh, style and uh, making it relevant to consumers is you know something that you're well known for um, talk to me first about the, those early days of IPA how you grew attracted to the style and uh, how it has changed over the last two decades yeah so I started homebrewing American style IPA in 89 okay and uh, it was one of the early things that I homebrewed down in San Diego and then I moved back to Temecula to help my parents at their winery. Um, so I grew up in the wine industry. So I pretty much have fermentation in my blood. I started homebrewing in the winery. I was a lot better than at home because we had sloped floors, sure, French sure. drains. Boilovers weren't near as big of a deal. I homebrewed once in our apartment in Temecula. And Natalie was like, never again. So <laughs> I took it out to the winery, which was awesome. Um, but I think the thing that's most striking when I think back to that time when I started brewing commercially in 1994 with my brewery Blind Pig and thinking back to the hops that were available then or the lack thereof. Right. You know, I mean, when I started home brewing in 89, there was a uh, little homebrew store in El Cajon, East San Diego County. Um, and I went in with my roommates to buy homebrew ingredients. And they actually had experimental hops, CFJ4 and CFJ90. CFJ4... I'm still searching for that elusive hop, <laughs> as is retired yeah, brewmaster yeah. Steve Dressler from Sierra. He's the only <laughs> one I know and can that remember that. But CFJ90, uh, do you know what that turned into? No. Centennial. Oh. <laughs> so when I started homebrewing, Centennial, Centennial didn't, was didn't, an experimental didn't exist. Yeah. Wow. wow. And, then, and then I incorporated into my homebrew IPA recipe. Yeah. Um, Columbus or CTZ, um, that didn't exist. That came along in about 95, so mid Blind Pig Brewery in Temecula. Mm. I incorporated it into the recipe. So, I mean, those are hops that are yeah. so ubiquitous now. In fact, you they're know, classic. Now, they're now old they're, school. Now right. they're, you know, thinking about how do we pull CTZ out using and getting a different hop in for different reasons, yeah. you know, for extracting and whatnot for bittering. So, you know, there wasn't all the designer hops. There were no breeding programs other than the, you know, the National Hop Association one, but that was all driven by the big brewers. So, you know, there was nothing coming out that was um, even relatively interesting, you know, other than Centennial. That was it. And CTZ was bred as a, to be a bittering hop. And so, but yet I was using it for dry hopping even back then. Um, do you know the story of Comet? No. Comet came out, so Cascade was out in the early, late yeah. 60s, early 70s. I don't know the exact year. Um, Comet came out right after and was bred for AB as a bittering hop, which I know brewers are out there laughing because Comet's like 10. 
<laughs> alpha acid. Right, but right. back then, that yeah, was that yeah. was high. You yeah. know, I mean, you'd have you had Chinook and Galena and Nugget, and that was it. But right. a hop like Warrior, you know, that's that's or Magnum, you know, that's like eighteen to twenty. Or there's some new ones that some right. of the hop companies have um, that are you know at that twenty mark pretty regularly. But you know, so a hop that was ten was pretty high. Anyways, it Comet was bred for a bittering hop, and a B rubbed it and smelled it and said, Oh, it has a slight citrus note to it. And it was like, okay, it was out. So I, I homebrewed with it and then it went away. And then it, <laughs> yeah. and then a few of us really kind of caught back onto it because there was a farm up in Yakima that re that replanted it. And, and I was like, yeah, I remember Comet when it was, you know, available. Yeah. And, um, so, so I think that's, what's most striking from an IPA standpoint. How do you, you know, I mean, at the time, you're right, hops were bittering. They weren't primarily used for flavor additions. How do you visualize, we're going to take these things that people are using this one way, and we're going to use them for this different thing, and then we're going to try to explore the various techniques that we can use um, that are not very popular in brewing at the time in order to try to you know, pull some of those flavors out? I mean, what does that create a process look like? You know, it's, it's, it's hard to look back and even know why, because yeah. I don't. I don't know why right. I built the recipe. So what is now, or what, what what's now Blind Pig IPA, because we own the trademark again, right. uh, goes back to the original recipe. So it's still bittered with Chinook hops. There's Cascade, Centennial, and CTZ in it. I have added a little bit of Amarillo and Simcoe into it now, but in pretty small amounts. So that recipe is still like 80 or 90% the same. Hmm. And, you know, it's it was just looking to do something different. Um, I had had uh, Rubicon IPA, which was out of Sacramento when I would come up to UC Davis for classes. That was a West Coast IPA, but there weren't, that was really it. Yeah. Um, Pizza Port in Solana Beach uh, had Swamis. Right. And, um, and otherwise, I had never had, a, a, you know, all the IPAs I had were all using English hops. So it was really taking the style that I liked and homebrewed with, with these amazing hops and just created it. But there was no rhyme or reason other than just, let's just try it, and it turned out really good. Back then, I would also homebrew and the first Blind Pig IPAs at the actual Blind Pig Brewery in the mid-'90s. I would always dry hop with oak chips. <laughs> and you know, I read about Ballantine IPA, that they would age in oak barrels. What I learned later on was that they were pitched barrels <laughs> yeah, right. um, so you really weren't so getting, we're getting the, uh, any oh yeah but it became a part of the flavor profile huh. of, of blind pig we don't do that now yeah, yeah but um i might bring it back someday and i look at those original recipes from blind pig and i yeah. say you know i should rebrew it exactly as it is <laughs> but there would be no way to do it because our equipment was so inefficient back then right right that you had to add so much extra hops just to get the hop flavor we yeah, had yeah. because of the inefficiency but um, but we still well, have the, the hops. Brew the hops are far different now, even for, as an agricultural product. Yeah. Even though they have the same name on them, you know, yeah. They, uh, yeah. They uh, there is definitely some shift there. Let's talk about that in a second, and I'd love to yeah. talk about the way that uh, you know some of your recipes have developed over time. Yeah. Uh, but first. Great beers are made from select ingredients. With BSG, you'll bring the world to your brew house with an unparalleled and diverse selection of ingredients from across the globe to just down the road. Their dedicated customer service team and industry experience provides you with the assistance you need every step of the way. Let BSG be your supplier of choice for products essential to making great artisanal beverages so you can stay focused on your craft. For more information, visit them at bsgcraftbrewing.com or contact them at 1-800-374-2739. Also, this episode is brought to you by craftbeer.com, bringing you the stories and personalities behind America's small and independent breweries. So I think it's interesting you mentioned that the recipe for Blind Pig has changed over time. Um, you know, that's something that, you know, I think becomes a classic debate among brewers. Like, what is a beer? Is a beer a recipe? Is a beer something else? You know, clearly for you, you know, things change over time. The the actual flavors of the hops can shift over time. Oil, com you know, things are bred in different ways. They develop in different ways. Year to year, those things change. You know, how do you think about uh, those recipe changes and the way what those brands taste like? And at the same time, you know, I think the other interesting piece and I think even the Anheuser Busch's, uh, you know, scientists will speak to this. The public's taste changes. Yeah. The people's palates change over time. And what's most important is that you know those beers taste like 
the people expect them to taste, not that they are the same thing. Where do you fall on that? And how do you massage those things, you know, over longer periods of time? I think coming from the wine industry has, is hugely helpful because, you know, brewers, I, you know, what's great about what, when we had a hop shortage back in, I mean, okay, it sucked because the prices of hops like quadrupled, but it really made brewers think that, you know what, the hops just don't, the UPS or FedEx driver just yeah. doesn't deliver them. It made you think about like, these are agricultural product and you, you actually do need to plan and contract. Um, although right now contracting has slowed down, which is not good for the industry. But, um, but what it, you know, what it did was it really, it just made me think even more about the ingredients. And I always think about our beers as not a recipe that, the flavor changes and you know during that hop shortage you had to get creative and maybe you couldn't get all the centennial you wanted so you had to figure out what kind of blend you could do to make or right. whatever that that's sure. just one example um so you know there you have to just be hyper focused on knowing your beer and but what I was going to say about the wine industry reference was the slow change, you know, in wineries, you always know that mother you're at the mercy of mother nature. Right. Right. And, you know, with beer, you you're the same. It's the same thing. And being so making changes slowly so that when you do make changes to a recipe and the consumer doesn't see it, hopefully, because that's what you don't want. Right. You right. know, and if you have a vision for you know, your beer, I have a vision for a beer and I think it's going to need to go in a different direction. You know, for me personally, it's because I'm seeing where the market's going. Now with that said, we're not going to make Pliny hazy because it is, it is, it's <laughs> oh, a, come it's on, iconic, make some, make some you know? hazy Pliny, yeah. you know, did, in the market, put I, it in 16 ounce cans. I, everybody would buy it. I did one send a uh, unfiltered keg to John at Alchemist. Okay. He visited us <laughs> once at our old production brewery yeah, and he yeah. drank it out of the fermenter and he's like, Oh man, would you send me a keg? And I said, like, okay. So I shipped him a keg. So, um, but, but anyways, having that yeah. patience, and, you know, that's why I got into brewing originally right. because I was winemaking. I was like, well, this is cool. I can make beer in two or three weeks. And, and I think it's ironic now that we do all of our barrel beers that take one year, two, three right. years for some right. of the spontaneous stuff. Um, but making those changes really slow and then, you know, just being hyper focused on what your flavor profile is, you know, and we've I showed you earlier our sensory lab and we've you know, we just ordered a GC and gas chromatograph, which is this amazing piece of equipment. And, you know, these are things I never even dreamt we would have, we would have had. And, you know, we're, I'm obsessed with DO and TPO and, you know, but as a small brewer that doesn't have any of that, and I, we were once there, you know, blind yeah. pig, all of our brew house was old equipment that was cobbled together. Our fermenters were plastic. Um, I remember when the great beer writer, George Fix, came and visited us and then later wrote me an email about these plastic fermenters and the, and it you know like so I started back with with literally nothing you know and mediocre equipment I think it's probably even less than mediocre and whatever the next grade down is from mediocre yeah but it, you know what it made good beer though but we weren't looking at a do or any of that stuff back then but I did know my recipes flavor wise. Right. And, you know, that's that's something that, you know, if you're a small brewery, someone needs to be the lead on the beer that says this is what it tastes like. Yeah. And I have a friend that um, worked for a bigger brewery and she told me a story once of going to hop selection and she, she rubbed some Cascade and she's like, oh, these smell horrible and the rest of her team were like oh no that's our cascade so she actually had to adapt to what their right. cascade was and so you know like our team here our lab tech and our production manager of production manager have been with us for a couple of years now and so when they came on they needed to like learn what pliny was and yes they'd all had pliny before but like really what is pliny and so i had to teach them like this is a you know, this is a stellar batch of Pliny. This is a mediocre and why. And and then they started to learn my terminology. What is a stellar batch of Pliny and what is a 
not not your favorite batch of plenty. We won't call it terrible or mediocre, but uh, yeah, you know, no. I mean, if it's terrible, uh, we dump uh, it. Right. And right. and in fact, two weeks ago, or a three, passable but not necessarily the shiny mm, example of plenty. Yeah, yeah. And I always ask a young brewer, like, would you dump a batch of beer? Everyone says they will, but when a push comes to shove, would they? We just dumped two batches of happy hops a couple of weeks ago because of an issue with a yeast pitch. And, um, and yeah, we could have pitched the yeast. It would have been okay, but I didn't want to take the chance, but, but back to your question, um, it's highly aromatic with a lot of grapefruit, pine, uh, lychee, and a little bit of dank pungentness, a little tiny bit of onion garlic mm-hmm. on the finish. Um, and all those similar flavors in the mouthfeel real dry finish um but still enough residual sugar for body and mouthfeel and you know we see these spikes and sometimes it's higher in grapefruit and less lychee and but one of the things that you know we look at is beyond those you know hop aroma and flavor you know components but we're you know focused on the normal things like you know, finishing gravity right. and alcohol and pH and uh, BUs, you know, even if most breweries don't have the high tech equipment to like start breaking BUs down and from, you know, different components of the of the hops themselves. But, you know, and, and, and we don't have an HPLC to do that. So we're we're still just doing a spectrophotometer yeah. BU. But one of the things we we uh, use as a marker too is polyphenols. So we every batch of beer. I have ten years of data of polyphenols. So um, and you know it's always surprising when or to a to a new employee that comes in and they see that that's one of the markers that we look at. And Is it, uh, what what would the standard be for polyphenols? So for Pliny, it's like three eighty or three seventy, okay. something like that. Blind Pig's a little bit lower than that, and of course every hop's going to be different. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I don't remember what our hazy IPA is off the top of my head, but um, so we use that as a as a, as just one of the many kind of barometers benchmarks that you know that we can use as a to test our beer and look at it. And the reason for that is that you know polyphenols are really the the dryness, mm-hmm. the finish of the beer. What I used to um, you know I, it wasn't bitterness, but I called it perceived bitterness. Right. And you know now. Um, I think brewers just outright just talk about polyphenols, but you know, to a consumer, they don't know what polyphenols are. Sure, I mean, the wine sure. industry would be tannins, you know, and, and but that's what they are. But they don't go away, right? And so, what I like about polyphenols and what I like about their contribution on dry hopping is that bitterness may go away, but if you're making an exceptional beer, let's IPA, um, and the bitterness does start to drop, but you have really good uh, you know, TPO that's super low and you have long shelf stability that even if bitterness drops, those polyphenols typically hang and will continue to hang in the beer with a, a dryness. Mm-hmm. And yes, it's different than bitterness, but to the average consumer, they may not know the difference between bitterness and the polyphenol contribution. Yeah. Now you've mentioned, uh, you know, TPO, total packaged oxygen, uh, you know, a little bit here. I know that that's a major, you know, focus for you because you are trying to, uh, you know, maintain that longer shelf life and lower packaged oxygen means it's not going to oxidize as quickly. Um, talk to me about some of the steps that you've, uh, you take both and everything from uh, your approach to, uh, to malt, uh, as well as to some of your production practices to, to kind of bring that uh, packaged oxygen down. And, and uh, how do you go about testing that to make sure that you're actually delivering low TPO? Yeah, so I mean, we're, we still sell our beer is, even through distribution, most of our beer is consumed within a month. But we still have this like heavy, heavy focus on DO and TPO because you never know what the consumer does with that bottle of beer right. or can of beer because we don't bottle. I say can, I say <laughs> bottle because we don't can, but but you don't know what they're going to do with it, and and so you want to make sure that you're giving that beer the best opportunity because you don't know. And and I'll be honest, there's one thing that bugs me about a lot of the younger generation of brewers is that they you know they don't have a lab QA QC program. Yeah. 
and they say, oh, well, my beer sells fast anyways, so what do, what do I care? And it's like, well, because you don't know, you know, what the consumer is going to do with it. You know, there's there are people out there that are like hoarding, you know, their hazy IPAs. And oh, there are. And it's like, what happens <clears throat> yeah, when, yeah. when yours is the stuff they drink that's three months old? I mean, to be up Three be, month is kind. I have... And, you know, run into certain beer geeks out there with nine month old hazy beers and fridges yeah. full of them. Yeah. And it's a little, you know, it's like you should have, you should drink that. You should drink that. Yeah. You know? And that's, um, but that's, you're right. They, and they will go and, and I'll even watch them rate them on untapped and then, which yeah. is just, just that. Yeah. Crushing. Cause it's not, it's not yeah. fair to the brewery. No. You no. know, it's like, would you, would you eat, would you eat six month old sushi? You right. know, would you drink milk? <laughs> sure. That's sure. Months, a month yeah. past, yeah, two yeah. months past, you know, so, um, you know, so that, that to me is, is something that, that I want to, yeah. what are some of your standard, like, what is your goal for beer that goes out of your hoppy beer, you know, leaving in terms of, you know, total package yes. oxygen. So our TPO goal, um, and it's changed over the years Sure. and I, and I, I want to, before I answer the question, I just want to preface it with, you know, when we started at Ferdinand court, our old production brewery, when we started bottling Pliny, our TPO was a hundred to 150 parts yeah. per billion, yeah. which I, some breweries that's standard. Yeah, that to me was like that's too high because all my friends in the industry, you know, I would talk to would give me their numbers and I'd be like, ooh, okay, I need to work on this. So we switched out our bottling line and and we we did it in incremental goals. We went from 150 to 100 and then 100 to 75 and down to 50 and and then you know we got to where we're at now. So our old production brewery, our goal was 30 parts per billion TPO. Uh, I've our goal now is 10. Really. We're, we've been riding at 20 for the last two months here yeah, in Windsor. Yeah. And uh, a lot of that is just our team from start to finish, um, which I'll cover in a second. Um, but we have uh, we bottled Pliny the last three days here. And each day we had under 10 on a few hits. We pull a bottle every hour, yeah. at least do a test. Um, and you know, I'm fo- You're using an orbisphere, puncturing the cap. Testing. Yeah. So, and that's, you know, that's something that, um, I think as the industry matures even more, um, I hope more breweries will invest in the orbisphere 6110 or Pentar has a, an, you know, equal, uh, unit that is true TPO testing. You know, I hear a lot of small breweries and, and I don't say this to, harp on them or be sure, mean spirited. Sure. I, I say it hopefully that they look, they listen and they, they say, Oh, I, I didn't realize this, but that, you know, taking your DO meter, whatever brand it is and piercing a bottle that's even been shaken, that's still not TPO. That's just a shaken dissolved oxygen number. And you can add 30 to 50 parts per billion to that number is typically average. What's, what was interesting 10 years ago when we bought the, the Hawk Orbisphere 6110 was what we thought were good numbers at what, when we were doing shake and DO. And then we did, you know, we put the bottles in the, the Orbisphere and it's like, ooh, it's like, wah, wah. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, but I, you know, so, but, you know, to me, the there's a from start to finish if our if we're getting high tpo and high do on the bottling line that could have started upstream and so to me having really low do and tpo in the bottle or keg or can if it's a canning brewery it's a it's a barometer of the entire brewing team it's it's showing like how tight our team is and can the average person taste the difference between 10 and 20 parts per billion? Probably not, but it matters to me. Yeah. And it yeah. matters to me because it's how tight our team is. And, you know, Eric and his team and packaging here at, at the brewery, if the beer is being fed to them at 50 parts per billion DO, there's nothing they can do. Right, right. It doesn't to, go down from it there. It doesn't go down from there. And, you know, and when you put beer in package, whatever your, you know, bottle can keg, you know, whatever oxygen you pick up in that process, it's going to start to absorb into your beer immediately. Right. So try another beer. Sure, sure. We're drinking some happy hops right now for this first part of the conversation. But, uh, yeah. Um, let's uh, let's shake it up a little bit. You um, you mentioned, I mean, and all breweries that move into new brew houses like this uh, deal with 
the issue of having to trans you know make make their same recipes work on new brewing equipment and that brewing equipment you know it's something that uh, you know most professional brewers you know thoroughly understand but i think a lot of home brewers and more amateur brewers don't necessarily understand that that uh, your recipe can work well on certain equipment and may not be able to be replicated at all or in anywhere close to it with the same recipe on different different equipment yeah. um you know when i was up visiting uh, sean lawson last uh, december you know he mentioned that like all of a sudden i mean the their efficiencies jumped up in their new brew house by i don't know 10 or 15 yeah. percent now yeah. now all of a sudden their you know their beer is more bitter the beer is drier you know and now you're having to do some massive adjustments because this new system is making beer in a different way yeah. even if it if even if it's the exact same recipe uh, than it used to how has this new brew house impacted you know even the way that uh, some of your classic iconic beers like uh, blind pig and, uh, and yeah. pliny are made so um interesting you mentioned that number for lawson's because it was 15 percent malt that we i lopped off every recipe to start base malt and um and then hops i lopped off 15 percent of the bittering hops off every wow hop addition and the that's a major change in a recipe the and you know and i've when when natalie and i were thinking about building windsor we went and visited breweries all over the country our vacations are always built around i think every brewer's vacations are always built around you know the going to visit a brewery even if you're with your family you have kids it's like oh, let me sneak in a visit to the local brewery you know my um, wife would agree with you on yeah that. Like, so yeah. um but you know we took these trips specifically sure, and sure. they were all over the world um belgium germany all over america and that's the one thing i asked and i had a list of questions i would ask every brewery and one of them was um, how much malt did you lop off when you switched from your old brew house to the new german automated you know so on and so forth and it always came to be about 10 to 20 percent one brewery was 25 wow. percent their their old equipment was extremely inefficient but um it also made their roi really pretty quick too and then and then the hops were more difficult right and so i found that i could for mid-boil finishing whirlpool hop additions, those could pretty much just extrapolate out, you know, divide by the number of, you know, gross barrels to the kettle on the old brew house times the 85 and a quarter barrels that we take to the new kettle, and it was pretty accurate. But the bitterness ended up being about 15% less. Mm. Um, that was a number that I just, because I, I would ask different breweries, and that sure, number sure. varied more, but 15% ended up being what it was. And so... Then you go into the hyper focus of the minor tweaks, and that's real. That was really hard, and um, and there is no science to this, right? Other than okay, gravity, we're a little bit high. We can figure out what our efficiency is, so we can nail the gravity. Um, one nice thing, I mean, there's not like a magical algorithm that you can just plug your thing into. There, are, and, there is not for hops. the Germans haven't figured that out. No, yet. no. But then it's funny working with Germans, and I think any yeah. any brewer that's listening that has worked with Germans, they look at Americans and go, "This can't be right." The a quantity of hops that we're adding, you know, to the whirlpool <laughs> right, or, or whatever, right, right. and uh, and yet that's also one of the reasons why we chose who we did because I wanted, we needed someone that was open-minded and, and not every German brew house manufacturer right. is open-minded, but yet we wanted the efficiencies and the, the know-how and the years of experience that they had. So that, you know, going back to the recipe thing, it, it then just comes down to taste. And that's where being an artist more than a scientist, although the science obviously is a big part of it, but just, just like, okay, the, you know, the Simcoe is still a little bit low. We need a little more of that pine lychee quality, grapefruit quality that I know in Pliny comes from the the Simcoe hops. Yeah. You know, or in Blind Pig, the woodiness that Cascade gives was a little bit too much, and maybe I need to back off on it just a little bit in you know in the recipe and. You know, and then having a, a nice hop like Centennial that's just always so, like, it's just a multi-purpose. Maybe I can just make up some of the aroma there, you know, to, to get to a balance. But, you know, the one thing I've said through this whole process is no one ever complained that their IPA was too hop, you know, forward in the aroma and in the flavor. And so it didn't, I wasn't even worried about the flavor and aroma. The goal was to be more hop forward. Yeah, yeah. If we came out the same 
as the old brewery, then we failed. If we came out at the same quality, whether it was shelf life, flavor, whatever, DO, TPO, then we, we failed. And, you know, the, so for that, we, I think it took us a couple months yeah, and, and we blended some beer from our old brewery over mm-hmm. here, which was very helpful. And then, and then from there, you know, it's just minor fine tuning along the way. And there's, again, there's no right or wrong answer here. It's just having to work through it and, and getting there. One of the th- biggest changes, and I showed you when we toured the brewery earlier, was we put a hop back in. Right. So, you know, where now there's all these new Fandango cryo and this and that and uh you know the noble hop from from yakima chief but you know we went old we went back and yes we do use hop extract and and i'm proud to say we were one of the first craft brewers to ever use hop extract yeah, at, yeah. at um at, at our original location out of corbell but you know the and that was right around when like simcoe came out as an experimental hop but i wanted to go back to whole cone I love the tradition of it. Um, I love that you typically get um, you know better foam and better head retention from some whole cone mm. hops in the process. And um, but you know I liked that we could have this hop back and it could be used as we can make a whole cone brew on our brew house without actually adding any whole cones to the uh, kettle itself. So all the additions get made in the hop back and the wort pumps through it. Um, It's almost like a hot side torpedo Mm -hmm. is the best way to describe it, like a Sierra Nevada torpedo. So you were telling me earlier, you've you've pretty much eliminated whirlpool hopping. Yeah, um, yeah. You know, for for your beers that uh, you've you know you know. Why don't you explain that to me? Yeah, so we've so we've converted all of almost all of our whirlpool additions, and that goes everywhere from STS to Blind Mm. Pig, Pliny, Happy Hops. Um, We got rid of the whirlpool edition, converted that to a, a whole cone, a hop back edition with the idea being that if you think about conventional whirlpool hopping, you add the hops at the beginning of the whirlpool, it spins, and then you pump it out through your heat exchanger to the fermenter. And I know there's breweries out there that are adding hops later in the whirlpool to try not to have the long contact time. But then you run the risk of dragging hops into your wort cooler and now you have potential buildup in there that doesn't get cleaned out and bacterial growth or they get dragged into your fermenter and then your yeast isn't as happy as it should be so anyways but the idea was that we convert our whirlpool edition to a whole cone hop back edition the wort goes from the whirlpool through the hop back over the bed of hops and then instantly right to the wort cooler and then so we've on the hot side we've captured all those volatile aromas but then we lock them in because we cool it down instantly Mm. and and what i was going to say a minute ago was when you think about a conventional way of whirlpool hopping you add whether you have a whirlpool proper tank or you have whirlpool in your kettle like a small brewery like we do at our pub downtown santa rosa you know you it may take 10 minutes for it to spin five ten minutes and then you're going to let it sit for 10, 20 minutes. And then you're going to take you at the minimum 30 minutes. I mean, we designed this brewery to cool 75 barrels of wort in 30 minutes. But most breweries, let's face it, are 40 or 50 minutes. Yeah. Um, but one of the reasons I wanted that really quick cool down, which meant bigger heat exchanger, bigger pump size, was to be able to lock in those hop aromas and not, not lose them. But also you're just going to make better beer. But if you think of a conventional way of whirlpooling, it's like I said, it's going to be five or 10 minutes to move the ward over, or maybe it stops vortexing and then you, you spin it and then it's going to rest for 10, 20 minutes and you're going to heat exchange. Well, now suddenly that last bit of wart has been in contact with your, uh, hops, your whirlpool hops for possibly up to an hour. Yeah. All the while you're, you know, isomerizing and you're getting more bitterness and maybe you don't want bitterness then at that point. And then also, you know, you're losing all those beautiful, you know, hop oils that are super volatile. So, but be, and because we did that, we then needed to add more hops mid boil to get more flavor back mm. and then more hops at the beginning of the boil for bitterness to gain that back. So, and you're not bringing the temperature down at all before it's going through the hop back. What do you know what temperature it's, it's typically at going through the hop back? It's about 
200. Oh, so that is, you know, it's yeah. still up there. Yeah, I mean, because these long, tanks are. How long does the liquid sit in the hot pack before it gets cooled? Uh, minutes. Minutes. Yeah. Okay. So it's yeah. it's quick. It's just passing right through <clears throat> over right, the right. over the hops. Okay. And um, you know that's the thing about these this German equipment is it's so well insulated. Yeah. That it, it can I guess that can almost be a disadvantage because maybe you do want to cool it. We have plenty of room in the brew house basement to add a wort cooler. Yeah. Um, it's not something that I'm totally keen on on doing just because. I worry about bacterial contamination sure. and I feel like we can get what we want with still on still being pretty hot but you know we're we we had very strict uh, parameters with Zeman and it was you know 8 minutes to move the wort from the kettle to the whirlpool uh, 30 minutes to knock out and that's passing through a bed of hops yeah and and these are all things that were in our uh, performance guarantees <laughs> yeah so um and and you know it doesn't always work early on because we're just learning the equipment and and you know zeman was here working with us and they still are coming out optimizing equipment making sure that it's right yeah and um so it's it's not an overnight process i always said that a you know, small brewery. It takes two years to get really settled in and get yeah. to know the equipment. And I'm pretty sure that's like three or four years on a <laughs> on a hot rod like this. We'll come back and talk to you in four years <laughs> and uh, and see how you're doing with that. Um, let's talk about cold side for a little bit. You know, I, I found it interesting as we were walking through the cellar in the new brewery that uh, despite all the technology and everything else that you've tried, you've employed here. Um, you've still got some old school. We're gonna, you know, pump the hops in from the top of the tank. Kind of, we got a, you know, a six inch port and uh, and a big funnel, and our guys are just gonna come up here on an elevator with a cart full of hops and dry hop by dropping hops yeah. into a tank. Yeah. Um, tell me a little bit about that. Why, uh, you know, despite all of these other modern approaches, you still insist on uh, on dry hopping uh, yeah. in that old school way. Yeah. So. For one, it works. Okay, and hey, you know, don't mess with success. The thing that the thing that really worries me about, um, and we used a hop cannon in our old production brewery. It was a, uh, it was patterned after a hop cannon that Dogfish had had years ago. Yeah, I bought a our old brew house at our old production brewery, two brew houses ago at the old production brewery. I bought from Sam and Mariah, and um, you know we would have never grown to where we were without that. There, yeah, it was the East Coast West Coast Italian deal from Sam to myself. <laughs> so, um, but uh, did he make you an offer you couldn't refuse? Uh, yeah, pretty much. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's another story too. So. <laughs> we got time. So, but um, um, yeah, it, it it was you know what what bothers me about the hop cannon and when I look back and I always talked about it with our team was you dump the hops in the hop cannon then you need to purge your that vessel and you know what happens if they if the brewer forgets to turn the co2 on or they you know they got a date tonight and they want to get out of there quickly and you know we have a a rock and brewing team but still you know stuff happens everyone's human yeah yeah and so you know i i just i like dry hopping from the top because although maybe you're going to carry a little bit of of air in, although I don't think we do because we're always off. It's always off gassing, even a little bit. You can feel it with your hand. Um, that it's it's really clean, and and we aren't adding you know any oxygen, so our DO isn't going up. And but it's also I think it goes back to it's how I've always done it, and so these brands were built around using this you know technique, and so if we're hydrating the hops and pumping them in. You know, I've tried that before, and it makes a totally different dry hop aroma. And for me, it's a little too grassy, so I I don't like the idea of mixing with with water um, and, and breaking them down that way. I've done it hot water, you know, deaerated water and whatnot. Um, so some of it is just following our our brand style. But what we have experimented with at the old brewery as a lead up to Windsor was mixing tanks, and we were only doing it because I had this idea to mix tanks that are dry hopping in a different manner. And so what I don't like about using a pump to mix a tank is the possibility of oxygen getting in there. And even if the brewer, you know, purges the hoses with CO2 or nitrogen or flushes beer through and dumps it so you know your lines are totally packed, that pump seal may be 
you know, in, right, it, it may right. not be, um, f- you know, at 100%. And so possibly you're sucking air in that way. I mean, pumps are the one place where breweries have dissolved oxygen issues pre-packaging. For sure. So what I what we did here, but I wanted to test mixing um, because I also think mixing a tank helps speed up hop creep. So once you get the hops, you know, going and that enzymatic reaction going that the hops are contributing, you know, and, and thinking about dr- hop creep too, I'm going to digress and go off for a second here. Sure, sure. Like I think back to Blind Pig. Yeah. Every once in a while we had a little bit of diacetyl that I would see and I didn't know what it was, but that it was never like it is now. So, you know, something has changed in the processing of the hops. Even like two years ago, three years ago at Russian River, we weren't having to dry hop near as long. So, you know, I I, yeah. I personally think it's kiln temperature. Um, you know, kiln that's what Jeff Irway was saying when I talked to him a couple of weeks ago yeah. on the podcast. He yeah. thought it was kilning temperature. You, you're seeing the same thing? Yeah, that's my theory. I mean, we're we, we're a founding member of the Hop Quality Group, right, and we're, right. we're the ones that really drilled the growers to, um, to bring the kiln temperature down. Mm-hmm. And they did, and I think it's exposed another you know, an issue. So we fixed one thing, but it <laughs> opened up something else. But you know what? That's, that's, I mean, it's I don't whack-a-mole. Want, yeah, it's, it's totally whack-a-mole and, and, and we'll figure it out as an yeah. industry. And, um, but I love, I love that kill that the hops smell like they do. Um, you know, now if maybe someone's going to start taking temperature up, I don't know. But anyway, so back, back to the dry hopping. Um, so on through our tests with mixing the tanks, um, I didn't want to, mix tanks with a pump but i did want to have the ability to do it so on the back of the cone of all of our tanks we have a a two inch port with a ball valve and we can connect a uh, portable mixer Hmm. that is a a retractable mixer that's on a rod and then the impeller that does the actual mixing is flexible so it can either be straight so it'll push through the two inch ball valve uh, and then once you turn it on the the impeller opens up and then it can mix the tank. And so it's something that we used in the wine industry and it's still used in the wine industry. But I remember specifically as a kid using a Guth tank mixer. And so this retractable arm, you can connect the, the tri clamp or din fitting to the tank and it's sitting on a stand and then you open the ball valve and you can push the arm in and it's about two or three feet long and it's at an angle in the tank. And there's mm. been all kinds of science done about mixing a tank with an impeller at an angle, whether it's up or down, is better than being horizontal mm. and that you get a better mix of a tank and that the certain uh, mixer can mix a, a 300 barrel fermenter and it can turn it in like 20 minutes. Oh, wow. Um, so it's pretty fast. And, and we've got sight glasses on the top of all of our new fermenters so we can see as it mixes to see that the hops are being broken apart. So that's something we, we are experimenting with now. And there are batches of Pliny out in the market. Um, and, and I yeah. think Blind Pig now too that have been through this process. And, and you know, we're trying to... Does it work? We haven't. We we don't know that we can reduce our hop load. Mm-hmm. I think we're too we're too soon for that. But I do know from our past experiences that we can we can dry hop quicker and speed up the process. For me, it's it's mainly getting that enzymatic process started faster right. to get hop creep okay. passed. But um, but I but I do like mixing hops. Um, and it's you know and and we didn't want to. I mean that was one of the things we had to really rain ourselves back on with a new brewery you know with a with a brewery like this we have all these new toys you know the brew house the open top fermenters these amazing tanks you know that we have the ability to mix the hops in but you know this crazy bottling line but we needed to make pliny and blind pig like it was at the old brewery first and not be too you know anxious to to, to, to move forward and, and try all these new things without making sure we mastered our old technique on the old brewery. Because it, it was managing the variables one at a time so yeah. that you can tell what the impacts of those variables are rather than doing it all at once. It was hard enough just the brew house alone, like <laughs> right. we were talking about, you know, a few minutes ago, you know, about how do we match 
flavor match. I mean, one of the things we did there was I started once Natalie and I knew we were going to be in North Santa Rosa up by the airport and maybe in Windsor, which is where we ended up. Um, I was coming up to a neighbor wine, neighboring winery and pulling a water sample every quarter and then pulling water samples at our old production brewery and at the pub in San, Santa Rosa and then sending them off. And I, we have we had like two years of data of water just to make mm. just to see how seasonal changes in the yeah, water chemistry. Yeah, and then once we actually had water at the property, I started using this as the sample. Although the difference between here and our neighbors Dumal behind us was wasn't going to be any different because it was the same source. Right. But but that that made water that took water off the table because our samples between Santa Rosa and Windsor were like they're like ninety eight percent the same if yeah. not more. But um, but but yeah, so just you know, the, from the equipment standpoint, we had to really tell ourselves like, okay, you know, cool your jets, cowboy. Don't um, don't worry about the mixer right now. Let's right. just dry hop the old way. So that's something we're just starting to to mess around with. Yeah. But I but I I'm I'm all for it. But the other thing is is even if it doesn't work, we could you can never have built in that outlet on the cone of the tank after the fact. There's, right. It's you impossible. Had, to, had to plan for you, it. You have to plan for it, and so we have it on every one of our mm. closed top fermenters, just for that reason alone. Are you dry hopping with pellets? Or are you uh, using uh, whole cone hops for those too? That's pellet, and then cryo pellets. Cryo pellets, also. Okay. yeah. So a little, little bit of both. Um, how do you? How have you uh, found working with uh, cryo pellets, and how has that impacted uh, some of your processes? Yeah, I, I like that. It's you know, I love the idea of cryo because of the reduced green matter. Um, it's um, it's not something we jumped into uh, early on. Mm-hmm. Um, I was I was the first commercial brewer to use Sabro or yeah what we call Ron Mexico, but um, <laughs> four three eight was its number. But right. we were we were the first commercial brewer to use Ron Mexico because Sabro. You know, the Yakima Chief people are like say Sabro, but they all say Ron Mexico in the back. I know they do. <laughs> <laughs> But no, it was and that was that was through a project that Jason Peralta and right. I did at the Homebrew Conference a few mm-hmm. years uh, ago. Um, but um, and we tested the cryo on that beer because it, the beer didn't have a, a a background to it, so it was a good beer to test. But I also don't want to buy any hops, in, or at least try not to, that I can't do selection on, and particularly a hop that's going to go into one of our main beers. And so, you know, it takes an awful lot of hops to make a cryo run. And some hops we use don't, we, we, we just don't buy enough of that variety to have enough to do a cryo run. And so for that reason, I may stick with pellet hops just because I, I don't want to buy hops that I can't do selection on, mm. especially for an IPA. Even with cryo. Yeah, yeah. So whether that's warranted or not, maybe... Cryo gets rid of some of the yak, but um, an over kilned uh, or a, a hop or a hop that's picked too late, it's going to be onion garlic regardless. You know, cryo is not going to get rid of that, I yeah. don't think personally, but maybe someone else in the hop world will will tell me otherwise but uh, so that's the that's that's the genesis of those uh, onion garlic flavors is over kilning or late picking. Yes. And then there are some varieties that are just inherent habit. Yeah. And CTZ yeah. is one of them. And we dry hop with CTZ with the point. And the only and the reason we dry hop with it is because I want a tiny little bit of that onion garlic quality. And after about a week, the heaviness of it fades away. And then it's just a, an over, it's just a, a part of the aroma of what Pliny is. And there's a little bit in Blind Pig also, a, a CTZ that we dry hop with. But we, we buy our CTZ from a small grower from Seagull Ranch uh, direct, and he grows his CTZ based on a brewer like myself. And he knows he's not selling it to me to, um, to, to use for bittering, I'm, although we may use it a little bit for sure. bittering. I'm using, most, I'm using 95% of our CTZ that we buy from John Siegel. We're using it for dry hopping. Hmm. And he knows that... If he picks it too late or kilns it too warm, that it's going to show in the beers. And I'm pretty sure he has some other brewers that are dry hopping with it too. So we're, it's probably one of the most important hop purchases we make because it can, it can throw off 
everything in a beer like Pliny. And that's, but it's also one of the, the hops that we adjust year to year. Right, right. Because it's, it's an agricultural product. You know, and I, I think that's something that most, you know, brewers using hops don't necessarily consider. That uh, you've got maybe a one month, you know, four week, five week window in which hops can be picked uh, up at Yakima Valley. Um, and, you know, certain varieties mature at different, you know, phases during that window. There are some that get picked early. There's some that get picked later in that window. Um, some of the mix that hops growers have to consider in the way that they grow and plant is when their various crops are going to mature because you can't pick everything in one week. You know, there's a limited number of agricultural workers. You've got a limited number, limited space in your kiln, you know, every night. You've got, you know, your your, uh, cleaning machines, you know, and so you've got an infrastructural investment there that literally only gets used for one month out of the year. Like, I mean, which is absolutely nuts when you think about the way every other capital, uh, you know, kind of equipment purchase gets used. Like everyone else, you wouldn't buy a brew house that you only used for one month out of the year yeah. and spend that kind of money. That's crazy. Of course, we're in the middle of wine country and everyone does that everyone here. Everyone does that here, <laughs> right. So, you know, so so there's this major capital investment. And they can't necessarily just keep building more so that you yeah. can pick everything on in one week. Although maybe with hops prices going where they yeah. are, they, they can eventually afford that. Yeah. Um, you know, so thinking about that in an agronomic term of when when, you know, what you're growing so that you can pick everything at a, at a kind of peak time, you know, is a major concern for these growers. And because it actually, you know, really does impact the way that, you know, you as a brewer, um, you know, relate to this thing. Yeah, picking windows, a huge part of growing hops that, yeah. that most brewers don't think about. And, uh, you know, citra and mosaic are harvested at the exact same time Hmm. Uh, when natalie and i go up and do hop selection every year we stay at one of our friends farms and um i mean we're i love it because we're in it the trucks rumble by every 20 minutes and uh it's 24 hours a day i wouldn't have it any other way and um but we come home every night and it's like you smell is that sim or is that uh, mosaic or is that citra but they're right on top of each other, and that's problematic. Yeah, that is major issue, especially the way that both of those hops have have taken off. Right, and um, and you know, like we we build our hop selection trip around Simcoe because it's to me, it's the other than the CTZ which I just mentioned. But I know that John is going to pick at the right time, and there really isn't much of a hop selection there. If I went to another broker and said I want to buy CTZ, it's all going to be onion garlic because it's all picked late for for bittering. But like yeah. Simcoe for us is really important, and you know it's interesting about Simcoe is if you pick it early in its you know eight to ten day picking window, it's going to be grapefruit. If you pick it in the middle, it's going to be pine, and if you pick it towards the end of that eight to ten day, it's going to be more pungent and dank. Hmm. And Natalie and I every year always pick do hop selection and um, pick between the early and the middle blind every year it's like we know what simcoe is to russian river yeah that's important to us but we also make this all simcoe beer row two hill 56 and one of the reasons i'm really excited about growing and making more beer is that we can now buy more hops and we can start buying like early harvested simcoe because i've always wanted to make row two hill 56 which is again 100 percent simcoe beer with early harvested simcoe and get more of that grapefruit note but yet pliny is really iconic around that mid that that early to mid timing and uh and you know and and say okay these are for pliny but these are for row two or you know whatever it is and um you know and that's you know simcoe is important to us and so we build our our selection trip around it and we've been using simcoe forever and and i love the hop and it's still one of my favorite hops so that that's where we we lay our our roots around that and then we build our other selections around it Let's uh, let's talk more about this, but uh, we're going to have to do it in uh, episode two of the Vinny Chalurzo <laughs> Russian River podcast um, because uh, you know this episode is uh, is coming to a close. <laughs> You know, uh, we can. Uh, I, I'm enjoying the conversation. I can't wait to talk more. And we're just gonna have to leave a cliffhanger <laughs> ending out there uh, for everyone. Uh, before we go, uh, G&D Chiller is the brewing industry's premier choice for glycol chilling. Uh, the founders have launched SS BrewTech with a clear goal to advance brewing equipment design, performance, and quality. Uh, bring the world to your brew house with select ingredients from BSG and craftbeer.com's mission is to tell the stories behind America's small and independent breweries. 
Uh, we'll be back next week with part two of the Vinicius Lorzo uh, interview. Um, and we're going to pretend that uh, we waited a week to record it, but we're really just going to record <laughs> it right now. Uh, thanks, Vinny. Yeah, um, we'll, be back, uh, we'll be back next week with another episode. Great conversation. Thanks. This podcast is brought to you by Craft Beer and Brewing Magazine. For those that love to make and drink great beer, Learn more online or subscribe at beerandbrewing.com or find us on social media at craftbeerbrew.com.